What's up guys, it's All Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Fat Electrician video. So this one came out last week, and this is the Olympic Sniper turned Battleship Commander, Willis Ching Lee. So when we were uh, doing the unsubscribe clip, uh, unsubscribe podcast clip, the, I think it was like three days ago, four days ago, something like that, he actually mentioned this, uh, even that clip was from two weeks ago, and he mentioned that he was working on this video, so we kind of knew this one was going to come out, but uh, I'm excited to see it. So the fact that apparently this guy from what we saw in the unsubscribe clip, he was turned down from the military initially for bad eyesight, despite the fact that he was a Olympic gold medalist. I believe a multiple time Olympic gold medalist in sharpshooting, which is just hilarious. So anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. This man is the greatest gunslinger of all time and you've probably never even heard of him. Today we're talking about Willis Augustus Lee, aka Ching Lee. This man won five Olympic gold medals in a single year for shooting, then went on to become a battleship commander and use the same principles. I actually want, I want to check out what Olympics would he have competed at. It probably would have been like one of the early, early ones, right? Uh, Willis Ching Lee. All right, let's check this out. Yeah, men's shooting, Antwerp, 1920. You have five gold medals, a silver, and a bronze. Jesus. 1920 Antwerp Olympics. So this was one of the first ones. Um, man, they need to bring tug of war back. It's honestly one of the coolest things they ever had at the Olympics, and they don't have it anymore. Where is it? Uh, shooting, shooting, shooting. Why can I not find it here? Is it part of archery? I don't think it would be part of archery, would it? No, that's all Belgians. The Belgians apparently dominated that. One of the things I find funny about the early Olympics is basically whichever country hosted it won the most medals because nobody else could fucking travel there because back then it was like, oh yeah, it'll take you three years to travel here. <laughs> um... Why can I not find? Oh, there it is, shooting. 30 um, meter rapid fire pistol, team 30 meter pistol. Man, the Ameri yeah, it's surprising, the Americans dominate shooting, even back then. As far as, man, Norway is actually like, it's funny, because I don't even think you have like, uh, pretty sure they have pretty strict gun regulations in Norway, and they, they do really well in the shooting events, even today. And they have, um, oh, what's it called? The uh, modern pentathlon? Or no, no, it's not the mo Oh, it's the one where you, it's like skiing and shooting. And then the Norwegians do really well at that one, too. But anyway. That he learned at long range precision shooting and applied them to the massive 16 inch guns on the USS Washington to become the most successful battleship commander ever. And he did all of it with myopia. But first, a word from our sponsor. This. My, oh, let me. With myopia. Oh, nearsightedness. Okay. Yeah. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. Oh, Nicholas, I thought you would never ask. Mm. Is that a real MP5? Come and find out. I uh, I gotta, I gotta go. I'll be right back. One minute. <laughs> Maybe two. Do 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 do. Sorry about that. Like I was saying, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. All right, here's the deal. It's super straightforward. You give Delete Me money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet aren't selling your personal information because if Delete Me submits an opt-out request, these data brokers are legally required to take that information down and quit selling it. The problem is there's hundreds of data brokers and they make it unnecessarily difficult to submit these opt-out requests. So Delete Me does. You know what, uh, when it comes to these opt-out requests, like how does that work in terms of like the, the legal thing with it, right? Like if they have their information stored in another country, do they have to follow those rules? Like how, how exactly does that law work? Does all of that for you. And yes, most of these data brokers more than likely have your information because we've all signed up for a free trial or we've all downloaded a free app. And whenever you click that little check mark that says, I agree to these terms of service, inside of those terms of service, it usually says, hey, our app or our service isn't actually free. And the way we make money is we use this to harvest all of your data. And then we turn around. Yeah, yeah, no, that, uh, if, if it's free, that's because the, the app isn't the product. You're the product. 
how to sell that data on the internet and that's how we make money if so facto our app or our service isn't free we've just turned you into the product and yeah. now we're gonna sell you I yeah. think we can all agree that's not cool but that's the unfortunate fact of life nothing is actually free but here's the good news you sign up for delete me you use the discount code electrician it's gonna save you 20% you're gonna end up paying like six dollars a month to get all your information deleted off the internet and all that free shit that you've already enjoyed while it might not actually be free delete me can make sure it only costs you like six dollars a month instead of having all your personal information sold on the internet so go check them out i'll have that link and discount code down below let's get back to the video on today's episode of badasses with bad eyesight ching lee born in a small town in kentucky in 1888 his father was a local judge and had a lifetime passion for shooting a love for shooting that he would pass on to his son lee jr by the time lee was 10 years old he was such a good shot that he could shoot a bird in flight with his 22 because of that he became his small local town's pest exterminator anytime anybody had any rodent or any type of pest that they wanted gotten rid of they would call the young ching lee and he would take care of it for them in addition to his passion for shooting he also thoroughly enjoyed blowing shit up for fun because well there's not a whole lot to do in kentucky in the early 1900s <laughs> and america there is poop on everything! Unfortunately, <laughs> this would bring about a lifetime full of problems because one day, him and his brother decided to fill a coffee can full of black powder, have a line of black powder leading away from the can so that they could light it safely. They lit it, the fire went all the way down the line of black powder, into the can, and nothing happened. So they waited, and then nothing continued to happen. So finally, Willis Lee approached the can, looked at it, got close, opened it up, and then it blew up in his face, giving him severe burns all over his face and eyes. Due to the oh, damn. I'm guessing it just didn't have oxygen. That's why it didn't go off. The severity of the burns, it was believed in the days immediately following the accident that Lee would be blind for the rest of his life. Fortunately, he would regain a significant amount of his eyesight. However, his eyes were permanently damaged and he would have to wear thick glasses for the rest of his life. So obviously, the young Ching Lee was a pretty rambunctious kid and that translated over into the classroom as well because he is the classic case of the kid that's so smart that school doesn't interest him or keep him stimulated. So he has a bad habit of giving off tasks and doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh, mainly, he was a prankster and a humongous smartass. For example when he was 12 years old he was already chewing tobacco and the teacher would always confiscate his pouch of tobacco walk it across the schoolhouse and throw it into the wood burning furnace in the corner finally lee got sick of the teacher burning up all his tobacco so he went home emptied tobacco out of the tobacco pouch filled it full of black powder and stuck that in his pocket and waited to go to school the next day sure enough teacher confiscates the pouch of black powder walks it over <laughs> the furnace throws it in blows up the entire wood furnace <laughs> in true smart ass fashion when lee got in trouble for it he said look this isn't my fault you took my shit didn't ask me what it was and then threw it into fire that's a hundred percent occasion the teacher had the <laughs> Man, uh he ain't wrong <laughs> audacity to send lee home because his shoes weren't shined enough so he went home shined his shoes stuck paper sacks over his shoes and tied them up top with a rope he then walked to school and refused to take the paper bags off because he didn't want his shoes to become unshined and not be within the school's dress code with the <laughs> of all these things, lee's father realizes that he needs to get his son into the military as soon as possible so he has some way to positively channel all of this energy otherwise he's going to end up in jail or worse so being that he was already a judge he pulled some strings gets his kid into annapolis at the age of 16. annapolis is where he would get his lifelong nickname of ching originally it was a different c word that's actually a racial slur apparently it changed to ching over time just because it was easier to say now they didn't give him that name because he is asian he's a white dude from kentucky however he does kind of look like he could be asian he wears round th man you know he looks like um oh what's his name i can't remember the dude's name he's uh the he's the half half filipino half white dude he does he does like engineering videos and stuff. It's Michael something. He's an American dude, but he's half, half white, half Filipino. He looks like almost identical to this guy. That glasses. His last name is Lee, and he is a huge Asian history nerd. Sometimes even going as far as signing his signature in Chinese symbols. What I'm trying to tell you is, if this were modern times, this dude would definitely be watching anime. Oh, he's a fucking watch. massive You've weeb. Never kissed someone? Huh? No, of course not. Why? You're married and have children. Yeah, duh. But what's that have to do with kissing? 
Fuck you! Now, for his <laughs> he is thoroughly unamused with coursework. He pretty much speeds through it as fast as humanly possible so he can get back to studying things that he likes and going out and shooting guns. Now, because of this, he does join the Navy shooting team, and his senior year, he gets an opportunity to go represent the Navy in a huge national competition put on by the National Rifle Association. At this competition, there is a rifle competition and a pistol competition. Lee has been selected to participate in the rifle competition. Now, this rifle competition is a huge deal. There are 684 people they're competing and they are all qualified to be there regardless ching lee ends up winning first place earning the gold medal by getting a bullseye at a thousand yard target and he wins the entire thing before lunch god Not damn really having anything else to do for the rest of the day he's like fuck it i guess i'll go do the pistol competition now too just for funsies fast forward about 80 percent of the way through this pistol competition and ching lee is winning and he wasn't even there to compete in the pistol competition and as he shoots <laughs> different targets his pistol blows up in his hand because one of the rounds that he had had too much black powder in the factory it blew up his gun and messed up his hand not giving a shit turns around to his buddies watching somebody throw me a pistol he grabs it catches it with his left hand finishes the round with his non-dominant hand and goes on to win the pistol competition as well earning two gold medals being the only american to do it so after that god damn this, this dude like <laughs> it's like some fucking movie shit and it's honestly why like i'm surprised they haven't made movies out of more of these guys like the guys that he does these videos on it, they're like larger than life all the time and like very few of them have ever had movies made of them you know it's like uh, hollywood's always trying to remake the same shit over and over and over again why not just take one of these dudes and make a biopic about them he goes back to Annapolis. He's got both of his gold medals. He's basically the Kevin Gates of gold medals, if you will, and it's time to graduate. Now, bad news, he has to take a physical first, and after going all the way through Annapolis schooling, finishing the program, and just winning two gold medals in a national shooting competition, they decide you're not qualified to actually join the Navy because, well, your vision's not good enough. It's not <laughs> the fact that you just scored a bullseye at a thousand yards last week. So this guy, Chin, he does exactly what every other badass with bad eyesight would do, and he cheats on that fucking eye exam and makes his way into the Navy. Yes! Now, as an officer in training, he gets shuffled around to a bunch of different ships to get a bunch of different experiences, figure out what he likes doing, figure out what he's good at, get him exposed to everything. That's how this is supposed to go. During that time, he actually publishes his first ever article, and it's about the proper way of shooting a pistol. It gets published in the Naval Magazine, and he actually signs his signature at the bottom with a Chinese symbol again. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I like the quote that he actually put in this magazine. And that was, focus on acquiring accuracy before you try to acquire speed, which is eerily similar to the famous quote from- From Conor McGregor, right? Uh, also famous gunslinger, Wyatt Earp, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You gotta learn how to be slow in a hurry. My point- Oh, I, th I thought it was, uh, man, it also reminds me of the Conor McGregor quote. Is it, it's, um, what, uh, Conor McGregor- uh what it's uh precision precision beats power timing beats speed yeah per, yeah mcgregor precision beats power timing beats speed it's, it's kind of you know, it's kind of i thought that's what he was going to compare it to because it's almost it's a little bit different right and obviously it's talking about like you know fists and kicking instead of uh guns but still combat right just you know hand to hand instead of weapons Point being game recognize game they're both onto something and you should probably write that shit down now the young lee finally makes his way onto the uss new hampshire and that is when the occupation of veracruz happens all right super brief oversimplified version of what's happening right now it is 1914 and mexico is having a revolution and the new mexican government is not a huge fan of the united states of america because of that the tempico affair ends up happening which is the mexican government basically captures and detains a bunch of american sailors for a little while it's a big diplomatic nightmare between mexico and the united states because of that the president at the time Woodrow Wilson decides that he's going to put an embargo on Mexico and he's not going to let any guns into the country because he's scared that they're going to use them against America and in April of 1914 Mexico gets a huge shipment of firearms despite the embargo if so facto Woodrow Wilson sends in the Navy and the Marines to go get those weapons back now bear in mind this is 1914 there's no Higgins boats there's no amphibious landing vehicles nobody's doing D-Day type shit so there's mm -hmm. literally just a bunch of Navy and Marine dudes getting driven ashore in whaling boats hopping out and going to find these guns i guess because the president said so so you know america's basically invading mexico some of the mexicans get pretty pissed off obviously so they start shooting at the americans which you know not super happy about it but 
I understand the sentiment. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. Now, <laughs> the downside of shooting at people is they're probably going to shoot back, you know, assuming they have guns, which America always does. Now, somewhere along the line, <laughs> Lee's entire unit gets pinned down by these enemy snipers that are up on top of roofs and inside of windows and high buildings, basically shooting at guys lower on the ground, and nobody's able to shoot these guys back, and everybody's just pinned down where they're at. So, Lee remembering like oh shit i'm the main character with bad eyesight i got this <laughs> his gun and just walks out in the middle of the street corner in broad fucking daylight with no cover whatsoever and he just sits there with his gun sure enough after a couple of seconds somebody finally shoots at him but they miss and now lee saw where they're at and lee shoots back and remember man that's fucking that's like insanely ballsy but also really smart like that dude hits you you're fucked right you're just out in the open they're probably not gonna be able to get you right like i mean unless somebody's at the balls to run out there and risk fucking getting shot themselves to grab you but now you know where they are so Remember, ballsy ching lee doesn't miss and then he continues to sit there and somebody shoots at him and they miss and lee shoots back and Lee don't miss. And this goes on for a while, pretty much until they quit shooting at Lee, presumably because there was none of them left. When asked about this later in life, the only thing Lee would say was, quote, yeah, I think I got a couple of them. Of all the people <laughs> who actually saw it, many of them had a much less modest version of this story to tell, with some of them claiming as many as 12 men were dispatched by Lee, all the while he was giving them the first chance to shoot at him. Then, later during this Veracruz side quest, Lee is also credited again with saving a man's life by running through gunfire to get him and provide medical attention. The man is literally Clint Eastwood, except it's 1914 and he's real. <laughs> well, you're gonna look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. You still do? Uh, no. Now, because of the still of this no. movie, he's put up for promotion by his. I don't think I've ever actually seen a Clint Eastwood movie. I, I mean, or at least a Clint Eastwood western. I've seen some of like his more recent stuff, but I probably have and just not known it because my, my grandfather huge was a huge huge fan of westerns. They'd always be playing on the TV when we were kids, but I never really paid attention to them leadership and he gets denied because his vision is too bad and at this point his entire chain of command is basically writing letters of recommendation essentially yelling at the entire medical bureaucratic side of the navy that's denying him that they're insane because this guy's awesome seriously he gets like 20 letters of recommendation from high-ranking officers including the skipper of his current vessel the uss new hampshire and in that letter he says something along the lines of i saw lee crumple a man from 800 yards with iron sights at veracruz he can see just fine so he's <laughs> taken into consideration for an extended period of time and because of that he gets taken off sea duty and gets sent basically to the middle of the country and he is working for the u.s navy going to different factories and figuring out what these factories need to do to be able to better manufacture stuff for the u.s navy during this time he meets his wife in oscaloosa iowa then america enters world war one and he gets sent over to europe although he does not get attached to a combat vessel so he never actually sees combat after world war one lee would go on to compete in the 1920 olympics where he would actually win seven medals five gold one silver one bronze which would turn out to be the record for the most medals won by any one person at any one olympic games and that record would stand until 1980 okay just so we're on the same page dude just oh wait, was that the um it, oh, i can't remember his name i'm pretty sure the the guy that broke that was the swimmer bef that was uh and he held the record i believe until phelps broke it won five gold olympic medals for sharpshooting and he's having trouble getting promoted because he has bad eyesight in the, rest of the 1920s lee spends pretty much the entire time working on different destroyers just working his way up the ranks becoming a bigger and better leader now about his style of leadership everybody absolutely loves this guy that works with him because he has this way where he just teaches people what they need to do and if they're not good at it he gets them good at it and then he just lets them do their job he doesn't try to micromanage them he's not up everybody's ass he just wants to get people where they need to be Man, so micromanaging is so annoying so that they can do their job and then he goes and dicks off so he can go do target practice and build traps to kill rats because that was like his new hobby that was, <laughs> that was known for, building elaborate mouse traps on destroyers he had ones that were like air guns rigged up to trip wires that would shoot rats which is the most american <laughs> shit i've ever heard of in my entire life there was another one that was really popular where he had a little miniature guillotine that he had electrically rigged up to a push button on his desk 
and all the boys would sit there and play a game when the rat would run across it they would try to hit the button just in time to cut the rat in half <laughs> whenever, whenever there was anything to shoot at from the ship he had his own private stash of guns in his quarters and he would run out and there'd be these like glass balls from abandoned fishing nets that would be floating in the ocean and he'd run out and shoot at them from the deck and he'd invite the marines to come out and shoot with him over the PA system and he was actually out there teaching the marines how to become better <laughs> shots every <laughs> Bro, oh my god. Boys, we found a fishing net. Shoot in practice. But he absolutely loved this guy. So that goes on until about 1930, and then he finally makes his way back onto battleships and heavy cruisers, at which point he gets absolutely obsessed with gunnery. He wants to shoot the big guns better than anybody ever has. He actually ends up writing a paper that later on got published talking about how battleships need to take into consideration the curvature of the Earth when they're gathering targeting data, and he develops the calculations for the battleships to do that. He's oh, literally damn. teaching people how to treat a battleship the way a sniper treats a gun, and it's highly effective. Because after publishing that paper, another battleship commander actually took that data and started implementing it, and his battleship won most accurate ship for the next three years in a row, and he said it was all due to Lee's calculations. Okay, if you're not catching on, Lee is actually treating his naval career the same way he treated his academic career. He's not interested in the normal coursework of, like, leading and micromanaging a bunch of sailors. He wants to get everybody where they need to be. He wants to get through his work as fast as he can so that he can go do stuff that interests him, like pioneering new ways to be accurate with gunnery. Because of this, he develops a reputation as a problem solver. So, late 1930s, they send him over to Washington, D.C., and his orders are basically, get everybody ready for war because we know it's coming. Okay, now this is probably the least coolest but most important part of the entire story. This man essentially gets sent to Washington, D.C. to go to the <coughs> against the United States Navy's biggest nemesis, the Bureau of Ordnance. You, help you Michael. bitch, God. <laughs> You're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help to. everybody. Do you want to play another game? Okay, if you don't know, <laughs> the ordinance is a bureaucratic nightmare that does nothing but slow down and halt any progress the U.S. Navy tries to make at literally anything ever. Uh, does the Bureau of Ordinance still exist? I've, I've never heard of it. Uh, okay, was a United States Navy organization between 1862 and 1959. Okay, so they haven't existed for about a half century now. Um, this established by an act of Congress, transferred to the Bureau of Naval Weapons. Okay, which existed from 59 to 66. Uh... And then, what came after that? Naval Sea Systems Command. Okay, so Nav C is the current one. Okay. Yeah, I literally never heard of any of these. Interesting. I'm sure the guys that are actually in the military are like far more familiar with this stuff. For example, if you remember like a month ago when I made the USS Parchy video with loss and red ramage and he was shooting torpedoes at all these Japanese ships, but the torpedoes would hit and then not blow up because they were duds because it's a known fact that the Mark 14 torpedo fucking sucked and he complained to the chain of command and the chain of command told him, too bad, you just suck with torpedoes, the torpedoes are fine. That was the Bureau of Ordnance. So basically the chain of command has sent Lee to Washington DC to go toe to toe with these guys because they know that Lee doesn't have the time or the temperament to put up with their bureaucratic bullshit and they're absolutely correct because Willis Lee is about to turn into a wood chipper for red tape. So he, shows up and he starts learning and finding out about all these fancy new toys the Navy has that are just being held up by bureaucratic nonsense. For example, I don't know, fucking radars. Lee, the <laughs> old thinker that he is, he's like, you can put a screen in my office that tells me where the enemy is so that I can shoot them with my big ass guns without even having to see them. Yeah, put that on every fucking ship in the Navy. <laughs> but don't worry, because the Bureau of Ordnance and their infinite fucking wisdom doesn't seem to agree with Lee and they don't think they're going to be that big of a deal and they just want to put them on some ships and they don't want Bro. Oh. How do they not... Uh, the more I learn about bureaucracies, the more I fucking hate bureaucracies, man.
want to waste all their money on radars because they're dumb, apparently. But they know Lee's not going to take no for an answer, so they tell Lee that they can't get any more radars due to manufacturing shortages, to which Lee immediately goes, fine, then I'll buy them from Britain. Magically, the Bureau of Ordnance found all the radars he could possibly need. Imagine that. Okay, next <laughs> is American submarines. Their biggest weakness is having purified water because they can't purify water fast enough for how quickly they consume it because the crew needs water and the batteries in the submarines at this point in time also eat a ton of water. Luckily, there's a new EVAP system that's going to allow them to have way more purified water and it's going to be great. Unfortunately, it's held up in bureaucratic red tape. Okay, like they're there. They're done. They've been manufactured. They're ready. But the government wants to run more tests on them even though everybody in the Navy is like, no, they fucking work. We just, they're just not letting us use them. So Lee comes <laughs> in, issues the order to install them and if anybody has a problem, they can blame him. So Lee's just getting shit done. He's checking things off. Now at this point in time, whenever you're doing a bunch of paperwork for the Navy, there's like a status box where you hit it with a rubber stamp to tell everybody how important this paper needs to get through the bureaucratic process. Now there's three statuses. There's routine, priority, and urgent. Obviously in that order, urgent is like, we need to get this done as quickly as possible. Now, mm -hmm. everything Lee marked was urgent. He didn't give a shit. He needed his <laughs> shit done right now because that's just the type of guy he is. But unfortunately, they were still just not getting it done fast enough to his liking. So he's like, fuck it. I'm going to get my own rubber stamp made that said frantic. So then whenever anybody got Lee's documentation for the first time <laughs> in their entire naval career, there's a new word stamped there in red ink that sounds more important than urgent. So everybody's just like, oh shit we're doing this first and then lee just uses this to keep on powering through to get more well that's fucking hilarious <laughs> just <laughs> oh that's so it's it's so stupid but so smart at the same time and more shit done. Next thing is to get a schoolhouse stood up for the US Navy that teaches sailors how to read aerial reconnaissance pictures because that's gonna be huge in an upcoming war because they're gonna need pictures to show where all the reefs and all the atolls are and they're gonna have to be able to read those pictures accurately to get proper intel. So first the chain of command is like, okay, well, we'll get Hollywood involved. They know things about like cameras and shit. That's the right answer, right? And Lee and a couple of other officers that actually have good ideas are like, uh, no, why don't we just go over to Britain and ask them to help us? We'll send a couple of guys over it get them trained by them because they already do this really well and we're on the same team it would be great why wouldn't you do that we can share information with them and vice versa and we all get better together hooray at which point the u.s naval research laboratory is like no absolutely not because the united states navy is way better than the british navy and we know that because we conducted a study that we verified ourselves <laughs> yeah okay now in hindsight which is fucking hilarious because i I mean, I guess at this point, this is when the U.S. is starting to overtake the British Navy. But the British Navy at, at this point is still, like, the best in the world, right? And they basically were right up until pretty much World War II. I think we can all agree that's dumb, and that is why Lee ended up sending a guy over there anyways for any bullshit-ass excuse that he could find, and then ended up extending his orders every time they ran short, so he was just over there soaking up as much information and training as humanly possible, and that guy would actually come back and found the Naval School for being able to read aerial photography. Okay, so let's <laughs> on. Lee just keeps charging, tackling more issues. Next thing on the docket, the Mark 53, aka the Proximity Fuse. Okay, I cannot stress to you how important this one- Oh man, we actually just watched, uh two videos on this like last week on, on how these things were designed i i had no idea these things even existed and i after watching those two videos on them i'm now convinced they're arguably the most important thing to happen in the war one actually is this is one of the most important developments in world war ii is the proximity fuse okay it's basically the new type of anti-aircraft ammunition your only options prior to this were like shooting basically bird shot up at planes and hoping you fucking hit them shooting 50 cows up at planes hoping you hit them literally trying to hit a plane with a bullet or you had mechanically timed ammunition where you were shooting it and it had a timer and then it would blow up in midair and you're just hoping that a plane happens to cross at that exact moment and everything works out you're basically playing the lottery with all of those until the Mark 53 proximity fuse came out. Okay, it's a little more complicated than this, but it basically has its own tiny little miniature Doppler radar inside of it. And when it's flying through the air, that Doppler radar is emitting signals and it's reading anything bouncing back at it. And once something gets close to this ammunition, it starts sending the signals back. And when it gets close enough and those signals come back frequently enough, it knows that it's near a plane in midair and it just blows up on its own when it gets near enough 
to the plane, okay? It's the first type of ammunition that actually knows where the plane is and blows up at the right fucking time. It's a big deal. So naturally, the Bureau of Ordnance is like, wow, this thing's incredible. This is a total game changer. Let's We're not use get it. in the way for no fucking reason. <laughs> they, say, you, they say that you're not going to be allowed to use that new ammunition until it has a 100% reliability rating. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say that again. Bro, uh, like... First of all, what do they even mean by that? Like, uh, if you shoot one, it's a, a guaranteed kill? Like, is that what they mean by 100% reliability rating? Like, what the fuck are they talking about there? Because, like, like I don't think there's ever been anything in the history of anything that is 100% reliability rating, right? Like, all it takes is one fuck up in the manufacturing process and something could go wrong. I am... It's like... And not only that, but, like, we are watching the video on how to design those. And it's estimated that it took between, like, I think it was fifteen to 20,000 shots of just regular fucking shells in order to take down a single plane. I think, you know, even if you get the number down to, like, fucking five to 10,000, that's, that's, like, double the efficiency. Like, why? Oh, my God. I'm slower. The Bureau of Ordnance said that you're not allowed to use this new ammunition until it is a hundred percent reliable. Can you understand how fucking stupid that is? You know it's a hundred percent reliable? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing is a hundred percent reliable. Fucking condoms don't even have a hundred percent reliability, right? You want to get technical? Fucking abstinence isn't even a hundred percent reliable because Jesus was a thing. Okay? I'm pregnant. From my finger? No, you don't understand. God has blessed me with his child. You banged Kevin God from South Nazareth? You want to know how smart and forward thinking <laughs> Ching Lee is? It's like 19 1939 and he already knew that the future of naval warfare was going to be all about the carriers and he's 100 percent right but he knew at this point in time okay man that's actually kind of crazy because they were seen as kind of like this novelty thing at the time um it, it really didn't become known until like pearl harbor that this was like the new way like they, they were definitely used even in the first world war they were used but like the when they became like the dominant thing was after Pearl Harbor, so he's like way ahead there. Because they came and they wanted to build this class of American heavy cruisers. It was gonna be the Alaska class. They made two of them, but they wanted to make like fucking 10 of them. And Lee came in and was like, no, those are dumb. You shouldn't have made the first two. Take all those resources, all that money, all that everything. Build more fucking aircraft carriers. He was very adamant about it from the very start. And he ended up being right. And that's exactly what the Navy did. And it had a humongous impact on World War II. Okay, so bearing in mind that he knows that the future of naval power is gonna be all based off of carriers and planes, he goes and adopts a strategy that every American ship, it, we're, we're done. We're done with these like pretty observation decks and shit. If there's room on the deck, we're putting anti-aircraft guns. Every American ship is gonna look like a fucking porcupine covered with 30 millimeter <laughs> and 20 millimeter protocons. Okay, the only problem, he needs all of the guns. This dude sits down and does the math and figures out how many 20 millimeter Orlicon, how many 40 millimeter Bofors he needs to put on the decks of every ship in the U.S. Navy and puts in a purchase order for it and it gets kicked back because they're like, well, we're not going to put all these on the decks of the ships because, you know, we just don't think that we need that much. And Lee is like, cool, didn't ask for permission to put them on the decks. I just asked to order the guns. To which they're <laughs> like, Shit, he has the authority to do that. And they stamped his thing approved and send it back to him and he gets to order the guns. Then he whips out the old eraser because he filled out the last half of the work order in pen. And after it says, order guns, full stop, Stop, he erases the full stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the Navy. <laughs> and then every time a ship comes back into port, it's just like an army of naval dudes come on and just put anti-aircraft guns on everything everywhere. Then December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens at this point. Every uh, uh, I'm surprised they weren't already on, but I guess it makes sense because, uh, you know, again, like this, uh, that wasn't like the, the whole... That wasn't, like, the standard thing, right? The, the aerial combat, like, you know, the the aircraft carrier combat wasn't the standard thing until after Pearl Harbor. So, it like, it, it's kind of weird, like, how in high, Like, some things just seem so, so, so obvious in hindsight. But to, like, actually be the person to do it is actually kind of revolutionary. And it just makes you feel stupid when you're not the person. Everything changes. Admiral Ernest King, like top dog at the Navy at this point, looks over to Lee. He's like, this guy gets shit done. I need somebody to make sure that the rest of the Navy is taking this seriously. So he promotes Lee to the Admiral of Fleet Readiness. And it is now Lee's job to make sure that the entire U.S. Navy is like ready for war and treating this how they need to be treating this. And Ching Lee's immediate concern is security because they're, they're way too lax. Okay, they're not even checking IDs. They're just letting people through, whatever. 
whatever. I mean, the orders have changed. Like they've been told, hey, button this shit up. There's going to be spies coming, like whatever, but doesn't mean they're actually going to do it. So Lee's going to get to the bottom of that. First things first, remember, prankster at heart. He goes, gets a new military ID made, except this one has a picture of Hitler on it. He then proceeds to go and see how many maximum security naval institutions that he can get into with a U.S. Navy ID with a picture of fucking Hitler on it in <laughs> World War II. Guess how many he gets into? All of them. Oh Nobody my god! Him. Like it's so ridiculous. He's like, I don't, I don't think I look like Hitler, do I? I mean, I guess <laughs> we're both dudes. Uh, fuck it. We're just gonna have to get more ridiculous. So he gets another ID made with the famous female actress Mae West on it. And he's like, well, I definitely don't look like her. Let's see how much shit I can get into now. And then he still gets into a bunch of places. That he's oh not my supposed God. To with this Mae West ID. So basically he's chewing ass and getting everybody ready for the security level required for World War II with espionage and spies and all kinds of shit. Like he's doing full on Ocean's Eleven type shit. He's got subordinates dressing up as butlers, going into fancy hotels, stealing top secret secret documents from top government officials, holding them until they get reported as stolen just to see how long it takes, all kinds of crazy shit. So this goes great, and as a reward, Admiral King makes Lee the new commander of all of America's fast battleships. So now Lee's back in the game, he goes and immediately starts training the entire crew of the USS Washington. Man. That's like fucking, oh my God. <sighs> I just want to know how. Do they not even look at his ID? Like, I'm assuming they're just like, oh, yeah, we know this guy. It's it's Ching. Let him in. Because, like, how else? Like, th there's no way they looked at that ID and thought, oh, yeah, you know, that's definitely him. They had, like, oh. Why? How? I'm so confused. In gunnery and night combat because he knows that the Japanese Navy has a big edge at night combat or at least they did before radar he goes and then masters the radar to the degree that he's probably the most knowledgeable person on these radars in the US Navy except for the people that literally built them Sorry, I ran out of time and I had to catch a flight, so we're finishing this video from Texas in my friend Eli's studio. Anyways, yeah. back to the story. Not only is he training all of his guys in nighttime combat, he also has to basically go back through and retrain his entire gunnery department because he's not treating the USS Washington the same way every other battleship treats its guns. He's going through and treating each of the nine guns on the USS Washington like it's its own individual sniper rifle. And while he's doing that, getting the guns more and more accurate, he comes to the realization that all the targeting data and the charts that came with the USS Washington Washington from the manufacturer were wrong. They were off. They weren't accurate enough. So he goes to the Bureau of Ordnance again and is like, hey, your charts are wrong. To which the Bureau of Ordnance is like, no, they're not. You're wrong. Except for the yeah. fact that obviously Ching Lee doesn't miss. So he says, fuck it. And he redoes all of the charts and all of the targeting data himself. Over the course of the next couple months, he gets his crew and the guns on the USS Washington so accurate that he ends up having a light cruiser from his task force go 10 miles away. And then he fires the guns towards that ship and has the ship call in and say how close it was to the actual target and he can walk these shells right up to the wake of this light cruiser without actually touching it literally God like damn. putting an apple on top of your head and letting your buddy shoot at it with a bow and arrow except he's doing it with battleships <laughs> November 1942 the battle for Guadalcanal is going on and the Japanese Navy is being sent to go bombard Henderson Field which is an American airstrip that is instrumental to the war effort and they can't let it get destroyed so Lee and his task force get sent in to go defend it. And right out of the gate, this entire thing is a shit show. They're sending in Lee in the USS Washington and the USS South Dakota, the USS Washington sister ship. Now, the real problem, they're sending in four destroyers with them, but these destroyers were picked for the sole purpose of they were there and they were the ones with the most fuel. They had never worked with Lee. They didn't know how he operated. They did not really know what was going on, but it just kind of happened. They all got lumped together and got sent out to go defend Henderson Field. So they're out there on patrol. They end up getting basically ambushed by a Japanese task force that opens fire on the destroyers this task force has managed to hug one of these smaller islands to avoid being detected by radar opened fire on the four destroyers ended up sinking three of them and critically damaging the third at which point they start opening fire on the USS South Dakota at which point Ching Lee sends a famous radio transmission stand aside I'm coming through this is Ching Lee. Now this Japanese <laughs> Air Force has a couple of destroyers. It also has the IJN Otago and the Takao, both of which are heavy cruisers. And they have their flagship, the IJN Kirishima, which was originally a battle cruiser. But in the 1930s, it got a bunch of upgrades in armor and firepower, having it reclassed as a battleship. This is now a battleship versus battleship 
fight. The Japanese task force is continuing to target the South Dakota. Lee sneaks around the backside, clears the South Dakota, turns all nine of his guns and opens fire directly at their flagship, the Kirishima. And with the first salvo, he hits and then he keeps hitting and he hits more and he's hitting the enemy so hard so fast so accurately they don't even start returning fire and within the <laughs> of five minutes he manages to hit the kirishima with 20 main battery hits and 24 hits from his secondary five inch guns god damn you, uh, jesus like oh my god you're, you're on this ship it's do 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 because you're 40 shells in five minutes you're talking about like almost 10 a minute right so like every like every six or seven seconds you're getting hit with a shell each one of those shells is 16 inches in diameter and weighs 1700 pounds willis ching lee just bitch slapped the kirishima with a goddamn car dealership in five <laughs> hey, just so we're on the same page the kirishima has now been reclassified twice the japanese upgraded it and reclassified it from a battle cruiser to a battleship and <laughs> ching lee has now just downgraded it from a battleship to a fucking coral reef in five minutes this is the last time in world history that a battleship sank another battleship in combat now at this point the uss south dakota's had so many electrical problems that the guns are down and the radio's down lee has no way to communicate with the south dakota but he can tell that it's trying to pull away from the fight and it's still getting attacked by the two japanese heavy cruisers and the destroyers so lee not knowing the status of the uss south dakota decides that he is the most able man in this fight and he needs to get all of their attention so that they can come fight him instead so he opens fire on the heavy cruisers trying to get their attention which he gets he then proceeds to go the opposite direction as the uss south dakota so that they quit chasing it down and they chase him instead so they're chasing him down but here's the problem they're chasing him they're behind him he can't turn the ship around to shoot at him with the big guns without getting shot in return and he doesn't want to get his boat shot up because this isn't a boat it's a goddamn precision instrument okay <laughs> a giant fucking sniper rifle i don't want to be taking shots so he comes up with a better plan you see he hasn't just been working on the gunnery skills of the nine 16 inch guns on the uss washington he's also been doing it on all of the five inch guns as well and those turrets can still turn around and hit the enemy and they are so accurate with their fire that lee orders them to start targeting the searchlights on the other ships and they start blowing all the lights out so they're not going to be able to see the uss washington at night and then they start firing star clusters which is just white phosphorus the reason they do that is because remember the japanese don't have radar that's not how they're targeting the washington all they're targeting has to be done optically so now they the can't Japanese see guys shit are looking at night and there's white phosphorus burning as it's floating through the sky and it's going to fuck up all of their optics and they're not going to be able to hit the uss washington so ching lee and the uss washington do this and just lead the japanese further and further away from the uss south dakota until he's confident that they're going to get away too and then he just slips away into the night virtually unscathed he got hit a single time by a five inch gun, which is the equivalent to a grown ass man getting hit with an airsoft gun. It's nothing. For this, Admiral Lee would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by Admiral Halsey. And when he received it, his crew demanded a speech. He turned around and simply said, and I quote, you want it, I'll wear it. Which is <laughs> one of the coolest things I've ever heard a military leader say. Ever. For the rest of World War II, it was honestly pretty quiet for the USS Washington. They were involved in some shore bombardments and they mostly just ran anti-aircraft operations for the aircraft carriers because it was a carrier-based war. Then by 1945, all of the Japanese battleships had been recommissioned into coral reefs and there just wasn't any reason to have all the fast battleships around anymore. So they took Lee from the battleship and they wanted to use his talents elsewhere because now the biggest threat to the US Navy was kamikazes and they wanted Ching Lee to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this unfortunately this story does not have a happy ending because as he made his way back to america to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures on august 25th 1945 he would suffer a massive heart attack oh, that shit. would kill him in a matter of minutes so in conclusion that is a story of willis ching lee he is one of the most important did they say august of 45 so is that what they said let me go back here so 45 he would suffer a mass wanted ching lee to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this unfortunately this story does not have a happy ending because as he made his way back to america to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures on august 25th 1945 he would suffer a massive heart attack 
that would kill him in a matter of minutes. So in conclusion, that is the story yep. of Willis Ching Lee. He is one of the most important people in naval warfare history, and he gets nowhere near the credit that he deserves. And I would argue that he is absolutely the greatest gunslinger of all time. The definition of a gunslinger is somebody that carries a gun and knows how to use it. And I don't think there's ever been anybody on the planet better at that than Willis Ching Lee. Not only does this man carry a gun and know how to use it, he has a gun that carries him and he knows how to use that one too. Capable <laughs> a bullseye with any caliber of gun from a pistol to the 16 inch guns on a battleship this man could do it so thank you for watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out man being a multiple time olympic gold medalist is kind of wild especially the fact that he had the record until the 80s for most medals in a single olympics is there a little shit eli doesn't have the same setup as me i can't dramatically turn the lights off as i walk out Thank God for edits. <laughs> That's funny. So th he must have been uh, recording this one while he was down there for the podcast on the clip that we watched the other day. I don't know how long it takes his editor to do it. I don't know if it, uh, his editor just edits for him or if he edits for somebody else as well. Cause so some of the guys will just edit for like one channel because you can make enough money off of that. Some of them will do like a bunch of different channels. Um, man, it's kind of crazy. His final electrician almost at a million subs. He'll probably be, he's only 9K shy. He'll probably be at a million subs by the time we react to the next video. Uh, unless he releases something in the next like two or three days, then yeah. Anyway, that was really interesting. I honestly, I I'd never even heard of that guy other than when he referenced him on the uns unsub podcast clip that we were watching the other day. That was the first time I've ever heard him reference him. And then uh, I think this video came out. It was either that day. It was either right before, or right after we watched this clip. And I I remember just thinking like, holy shit, you know that that's gonna be the next fat electrician video we do but anyway let me know what you think below like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one